This is a rhinoceros chameleon. Um, and you know what that big schnoz, he's getting all the ladies. <laughs> if you're a bird nerd, you can go to Madagascar, see lots of different birds. There's over, well now there's over 300 species, but roughly 300 species identified. A third of those are found in Madagascar, so if you're, if you're serious into birding, you have to go to Madagascar, because you can't find these birds anywhere else, so you can't go birding anywhere to see them, you have to go to Madagascar. It's one of the few places where a third of the species are only found there. And not just the species, some of the families are endemic. So you can have families of birds that are only found there. This is a crested kua sporting a beautiful hairstyle. Here is, oh, so that was a crested drongo. This is a crested kua. This one's trying to invoke a little Sydney Lopper with the eyeshadow and the hair there. Um, they're quite beautiful. You hear them during the day. They call them in Madagascar the hour bird. They're supposedly supposed to ring on the hour with their call. We timed it. It's more like every 42 minutes. It's a little off. <laughs> There's a sickle bill banga that's only found in Madagascar as well. Beautiful bird with a, a sickle bill on it. And they call it the crybaby bird in Malagasy. Um, and they do so because it makes a, a crying sound. Something goes, wah, wah. Which is very obnoxious when you're surrounded by four or five of them and you're realizing, you know, maybe I shouldn't have kids if the bird's bothering me. <laughs> Some wonderful mammals in Madagascar. Over 200 species are found in Madagascar, and this is interesting. Half of them are primates. There's no other country where half of the fauna or the mammalian fauna are locked up in primates. So if you're a primatologist like me, Madagascar is a place to go. All the terrestrial species found in Madagascar, things like fusas, you probably have heard of those, they're only found in Madagascar. This is a Congressman's leaf nose bat. One of my favorite animals in Madagascar is this guy, because I have a personal connection with him. This is a, a tough-tailed rat. So you can see a beautiful tough-tailed, adorable face. Fortunately, when you hear rat, you think something disgusting, but they're not. They're very cute. And I would wake up to this young uh, rat at the top of my tent. He'd sit there between my tent and my fly. And when Karen and my wife and I were doing our research, we would realize that as it's cold at a certain time of the year, so our body heat was warming the tent. And he would come every night and just camp out at sort of the apex of where all the heat was was sitting, and then we'd unzip the tent, he'd realize it's time to get up and go shuffle off to this branch. I would take a few photos of him, we'd rinse and repeat through that every day um, until he would go off and find a mate. This is a tenrack. This is quite an amazing creature. They're only found in Madagascar. They look like hedgehogs and are quite unique, quite interesting. And for the ladies in the audience, you could, you could think about this one when you have your first child, because this animal can have up to 30 there are 30 babies at one time. Imagine dealing with that. You have to deal with 30 rugrats chasing after you day in and day out. When you're studying in, in the wet season, they just come out, there's babies everywhere, and the mothers come together. They don't see well, so if you just stand there, eventually, this happened to us a few times, they actually will run into you. They squeak, and then they realize something terrible has happened. Maybe they're going to be consumed by a large primate. They all break out and just scatter in all different directions. They're really cool. But the reason most people go to Madagascar are these guys. Leaping lemurs. There's over 100 species of lemur in Madagascar. All of them are only found in Madagascar naturally. It's the only place you can find lemurs. And they can leap. They can jump. You can see this guy's making a big jump. He's doing an 8 meter leap from tree to tree. And they're the longest leaping animal in the world. So they actually can clear 10 meters side to side. That's an incredible feat. These are called shafakas. They can do some of the more spectacular jumps. And I absolutely love animals that have golden fur, or golden animals, golden toes, or golden whatever. If you tell me there's a golden something nearby your house, I will come over there and look for it. I love golden things. And there's actually a golden shafaka. And I heard that. I knew I wanted to see it. So I went to a place that had it. I hiked through the forest. Found him, took his picture, and said, yeah, I got that golden shafaka. But it's incredible. So think of a primate with golden fur. It's just outrageous. Here's another shafaka again. And this one shows his nice long femur. So what he does is he sits cocked on the tree, and he actually explodes like this in the air, twists, and lands on the next tree. That's how they do that big jump. Oh, we got there, we thought, okay, we're good. we went to study. We went to study the first one. This is Zabumafu, the same as Zabumafu. We went to study that one. And we thought, okay, it's going to do these 10 meter jumps, that'll be fine, and we'll, just, we'll just walk the 10 steps to the next tree. What we didn't realize is that they don't just jump and land on the tree, they ricochet and then bounce tree to tree to tree. 
And you're like, oh man, every step they're taking is 10 meters. So they go 10 steps, it's 100 meters. Well, that's kind of hard to find. If you ever saw gummy bears, if you're old enough to remember that cartoon, where they drink the gummy bear juice and then they bounce to the forest, that's what these guys do, and it's outrageous. Now, fortunately, Carrie Ann, my wife, she's very smart. She realized they only use certain trees. Because when you think about it, they have to be a certain thickness and height and such to be able to take that impact. And so when they would go, she'd be like, I bet they're going to go to that tree they like. And she'd go and meet them there instead of trying to chase them through the forest because it would be so hard to find. So she'd go out there and inevitably they'd come and meet her. These are mongoose lemurs. They're actually extremely endangered in Madagascar, but uh, they've been introduced to a nearby island. So they're doing well on that island. They're like raccoons on the other island, but in Madagascar they're quite hard to find. The male and female are interesting because they're different in color. The female has the white chin, the male has the orange chin. This is a bamboo lemur. It's a ridiculously adorable animal. It can also zip through the forest with its uh, specialized locomotion, but it's the most specialized primate in terms of diet. It only eats bamboo grasses. And so it goes from one bamboo to the next, just chomping away, chomping away, to the next bamboo, chomping away, chomping away, and it keeps on going. And they're one of the few primates you can actually track because they drop their food and bamboo sort of browns over a, a determined time. You can tell where they are gone or where they've been. You can actually track them by looking at their, at their food. They're really interesting that way. This is a um, black and white rough lemur, usually found in very high um, uh, forests, from high up in the canopies. This is a lemur that used to be a pet that's been taken away from the owners and put into a lemur sanctuary. Um, and he's taking a keen interest in my lens here. Um, and they're, they're obviously very adorable uh, creatures, uh, but make terrible pets. Here's the ring-tailed lemur. It's much more famous. It's the King Julian off of the, the cartoon Madagascar. They're smarter than King Julian is, is, uh, is made out to be. And they're actually one of the most interesting lemurs and one of the most interesting primates in terms of their vocal repertoire. We have a student here at the U of T, um, uh, Laura Bolt, that studies their vocal repertoire. And they're, um, they can make more calls than almost any other primate. They, they bark, they meow, they chop. They, they've invented words to describe the sound they make. That's how incredible these guys are. Now, of course, there's all sorts of shapes and sizes, so there's even mouse lemurs. So this is a small little mouse lemur. They're the smallest primate in the world, something like 30, 40 grams. That's the size of an egg, just to give an idea. That's the smallest primate. So think about a, a mouse-sized primate. That means it's a really intelligent animal. So imagine a mouse with a primate's brain. They also love bananas, which is, I guess, sort of typical for, uh, for our conceptions of primates. We spent a ridiculous amount of effort trying to make sure they wouldn't eat our bananas. And I think they just laughed at us because they always figured us out. It wasn't like hiding uh, you know, bananas from a rat or a mouse. And I think just to sort of piss us off, they would eat one bite out of every banana. <laughs> and instead of just eating the one, um, just because of all the effort we put into it. This is what some refer to as a furry little Yoda. You can see that, I think. This is a leka lemur, a sportive lemur. They're nocturnal like the mouse lemurs, and they hide in tree holes during the day just in case a big raptor comes, they can duck into the tree hole afterwards. This is one that's hiding in the tree hole just because he's scared that something's around. In this case, it's not a raptor. It happens to be a jerk with a camera and a flash with me, and uh, eventually he'll realize it's me and he'll come back up. But, uh, but they're fascinating because they'll sit up waiting kind of sleeping, sort of awake, and then if something comes by, whoop, they get sucked in like a vacuum into their tree and disappear. The largest animal in Madagascar that's native as far as we know, um, I guess besides the crocodile, the largest mammal, this would be um, the injury. And this they call Baba Kutu in, in Malagasy. So that means, means small child uh, of, of the forest. And they are quite spectacular in that fact that they can make these massive 10 meter, meter jumps. These are the ones that do the largest jump. But they're the main reason I originally wanted to come to Madagascar in the first place. How many of you have been to Central and South America? How many of you have heard howler monkeys? It's an incredible sound. It's one of the most incredible sounds you can ever hear. It's the loudest primate in the world. And we had the privilege of studying howler monkeys for about three years in Belize. And I thought, okay, I've hit the, the loudest primate. I want to hear the injury, which is the second loudest primate. And they sound nothing like uh, le uh, uh, howling monkeys. They're just incredible. So I'm going to play a clip. It's probably going to be very loud, so I'll turn it down as it's playing. Um, so get ready to cover your ears because they're that loud. 
Here we go. So it's outrageous. It's like someone threw a trumpet into a primate's throat. <laughs> now I want to play it one more time because it, it shows a really interesting specialization of, of um, strepsirines, which are, which are lemurs and, and lemur-like animals. And they have this tooth comb. They have teeth that are specialized incisors that stick straight out. And so they can keep this, this fur looking so beautiful. They sit there grooming themselves all day or grooming each other. And if you look, when, when the one's calling, it opens its bottom lip and you'll see the tooth comb sticking out. Take another look. Right here. That's outrageous. Every time I go to Madagascar, I go straight to this place, or at the end of my project, I go straight to this place. Because it's a place you can almost always guarantee to see them. And so far, knock on wood, 90% of the time I've heard them. And I've been hoping, because they get quite close to you, that one day, this is high on my bucket list, they, they use that tooth comb on me. <laughs> so, let's talk a little bit about what I do. So we've left why Madagascar is so amazing. So you can understand why I would want to go to Madagascar. It's just too incredible. Who wouldn't want to go to Madagascar? I think now you're all convinced you want to go to Madagascar. So I go there and I conduct research, and I study the biogeographic patterns affecting species richness and occurrence and fragmented landscape. So the translation of that is that I go to where a two fragmented forest, those chunks of forest I showed you before, and I look for where lemurs are, how many are there, and why. Why are they still there, or why are they not there? So that's what I do. And I do it, here's a picture of that same um, image I showed you before, but now all the fragments are in red. So these are different chunks of forest that have been, were once connected to this green part here, which is the continuous forest, but it's now separated. So that affects species. So this area is about the size of a third of Manhattan. There's roughly 42 habitat fragments, as small as 0.23 hectares, and as large as 117 hectares. Even the large ones are small by, by most standards. But the smallest one is half the size of this room, just to give you an idea. And so that's the one that I've pointed to here. I'm going to show you a picture of that. In this landscape, we expect eight species in the continuous forest, is where there's eight species. So we expect there to be eight species there, or at least we would hope. Here's that tiny little fragment. And when I first got to this landscape, I thought, geez, there's not going to be any lemurs here. I have picked the wrong place to do research. And fortunately, um, we actually found lemurs. And we even found lemurs in this fragment, which is incredible. We were looking for these guys. This is the eight different species we we're looking for. So similar cast of characters I showed you earlier. Uh, with a few additions, we've got the abadi in the top right, and the bottom one, the uh, fat-tailed dwarf lemur, which gets a beautiful fat tail at the end of the season. And it actually hibernates in, in the winter. It's the, the longest hibernating uh, primate, one of the only hibernating primates. And I didn't do this alone. This type of project takes a lot of effort. There's actually quite a few people in the audience here that helped me with this project. Kim was doing her project when she was there, but also giving me some help and some advice. And then my wife, Carrie Ann, and Yuri's over there in the crowd. All these people helped me. But I also had 30 different staff from Madagascar working on this project as well. And this was the core of the team that was living in the camp. Um, and this is at the end of the project, so I'm all thin because I've lost all this weight. But they get free food, and so they've been eating as much as they can. So a lot of them gain weight. They were, they were super happy. One of them gained like 25 pounds. <laughs> and you're just like, just eat so much. And we moved the table, and you could see where he had been because of all the food that fell off his plate. <laughs> now, getting to a place like this isn't easy. You have to pack um, equipment and food. We needed, I think it was something, I always forget the numbers, but it was upwards of 500 kilos of rice and beans which we had to resupply, had to get 200 more kilos at the end of the project. Um, water, batteries, GPSs, um, uh, cell phones, uh, solar panels, all this stuff. And there's no water in this landscape. And I'm going to show you what it looks like. We had to drive up there in a caravan of vehicles, and then there's no road to get there where we wanted to go. So we had to use that satellite image I showed you before, take a GPS point off that, send it in your GPS, and just tell the guy to go that way. And we would go like this through the savanna with people walking in front because of erosion scars could easily swallow up the vehicles. We actually were driving slowly than you could, slower than you could walk. It was uh, quite onerous. This truck is just carrying water for the project. Um, water was really important. Once we got there, we set up camp. This was our home for a few months. Stayed there for seven months in the second project and uh, two in the first project. 
We set up the kitchen, kept everything elevated so none of the creepy crawlies would get into our food, um, namely rats and, and small mice. And then we eat breakfast in the morning, get up at sunrise, go look for some lemurs. Here I am eating some sort of mixture of rice, which is what you eat when you're doing research in Madagascar three times a day. Rice something in the morning, rice something in the afternoon, rice something for dinner, and some sort of rice dessert drink for, uh, for after dinner. Which I said, if they feed me that one more time, they're getting fired. Because I'm not drinking rice for dessert, I said. Not so I can't go that far.